I'm going to talk to you today about some projects that uh, the firm that I work for has been uh, conducting in Papua New Guinea to do with archaeology, but more importantly involving the local communities in that archaeological survey and work. We've been working up there since 2010. I'm a, an historical archaeologist from Sydney in Australia, but uh, I've been given the opportunity to look at some World War II sites in Papua New Guinea in a number of locations, two of which I'll talk to you today about. Now, there is a distinction I should make at the beginning of the talk between what we refer to now as conflict archaeology and battlefield archaeology. Battlefield archaeology uh, is a discipline or a subdiscipline of archaeology that was really developed in, initially in America at the site of the Battle of the Little Bighorn by a gentleman named Scott who, after a brush fire there, discovered that a lot of physical remains of the battlefield still remained on the site. And he was able to, using forensic analysis, look at the course of the battle, for example, looking at different types of rounds that were used by both sides of in, in the battle, the Indians and the American 7th Cavalry. He was able to map out where some of the uh, course of the battle had taken and where even uh, weapons had been swapped from one side to another as people had been killed and, and a rifle had been picked up by someone from the opposite side. So battlefield archaeology as a subdiscipline looks at battlefields specifically. And so some other notable examples, human remains found in the uh, 1980s at the site of the Battle of Towton were able to demonstrate some of the horrific injuries that some of those 15th century combatants had suffered and had died from and, and were subsequently buried. The uh, Battle of Bosworth Field, where the Crown of England changed hands, Richard III's demise. The site of the battlefield was uh, hotly contested from a number of villages around Bosworth and it's recently been narrowed down to uh, one field on the basis of uh, archaeological finds in that ploughed field. Another important site in Europe, what's known as the Varoschlacht or the Battle of the Teutoburger Forest, when the uh, Germans under Arminius destroyed three legions uh, of Augustus. And uh, the site of that battle was also widely debated for many, many years since the 19th century. And that site has recently been discovered and part of the course of that battle is also been determined through the archaeological finds. So that's battlefield archaeology. The subject that's now referred to as conflict archaeology tends to widen that out quite considerably. So it, while it can investigate the sites of battles, it looks at wider aspects of battles and conflict and some of the social consequences of uh, those conflicts and looks at human experience in anthropological terms, the landscapes associated with some of these sites, how people remember conflict and how it affects people through generations cultural heritage, how people maintain some of these sites in their memory through material culture, through visiting museums, how museums treat material culture from these battlefields, tourism and military history. So some of the sites that are looked at in this wider conflict archaeology subject are concentration camps, a subject that many would think uh, would be a very touchy subject to look at in terms of archaeology, but there's been some recent work done at Sobibor camp, identifying some additional gas chambers there, and even uh, Treblinka, where uh, some work uh, done by the Americans has uh, begun sampling some of the, uh, the barrack sites there. POW camps, a recent excavation at Stalagluf III in Poland, identifying uh, one of the tunnels used in the Great Escape some of the material culture associated with that, uh, that escape too. Um, a very interesting site in uh, Berlin at the Neiderkirchenstrasse, uh, referred to as the Topography of Terror, the old Gestapo headquarters of Berlin, uh, is now a major exhibition outlining uh, some of the material remains of the site there, some of the cells, but also explaining and interpreting that material culture to visitors to that site on the activities of the Gestapo in Berlin. Looking at monuments, there are major monuments as part of conflict. The Menin Gate, which uh, immortalises the sacrifice of the battlefields in the Western Front, the First World War, and of course uh, what's left of the Berlin Wall as a major demarcation line between East and West and the uh, actual physical manifestation of Churchill's Iron Curtain. And also cemeteries. Uh, Australians visit many of the cemeteries and battlefields at Gallipoli, 
and uh, the cemeteries of the Somme are resonant of the sacrifice made by those young men in World War I. So there are many more aspects to conflict archaeology than just focusing on battlefields. Well, some of the sites that we are looking at in PNG, the first one is on the Kokoda Track, which is just outside Port Moresby. It begins at Owens Corner and snakes its way for 96 kilometres over the Owen Stanley Ranges to Kokoda, which is uh, about halfway across the uh, peninsula there. The context, historical context of our site is uh, uh, reasonably well known, but I'll outline the major facets of it here. The Japanese landed on the north coast in July 1942 as part of their push and expansion from Rabaul, which they'd taken in February 1942. They landed on the north coast of uh, the main island of New Guinea and quickly moved to Kokoda in the centre of the isthmus there and then started to make their way across the Kokoda track down to take Port Moresby. The Australian, the light Australian forces that were there at Kokoda at the time, 39th Battalion and some uh, units of the Papuan Infantry Battalion, staged a series of uh, reasonably successful withdrawals, uh, contested withdrawals into the foothills of the Owen Stanleys, but even reinforced by the AIF at Isarava, they were still forced to retreat all the way to the south to Irabaya. And there the Japanese had basically done their dash. Their supply system was not working properly. The soldiers were exhausted. The landscape had in part defeated the forces of the Japanese as well and the Australians were able to begin reinforcing their forces. Importantly at this point, just as the Japanese were poised to take Papua New Guinea, they were asked by their commander, General Horry, to withdraw. On the orders of the 17th Army in Rabaul, they had been told that uh, they had to withdraw to the northern coast and to take refuge in their bases in the northern coast, but maintain also a posture a presence in the uh, northern slopes of the Owen Stanley Ranges so that they could continue to threaten Port Moresby for some time to come. So the idea was that the Japanese would then withdraw. The majority of their forces would move to the north coast, but they would still maintain a force within the Owen Stanleys to threaten Port Moresby, and that they did in the site at Eora Creek. So the Australians then were able to follow the withdrawing Japanese, and after they left Irabaya Ridge, the Australians didn't see them for about two weeks and had trouble keeping up with them. They were withdrawing so quickly. They ran into some rear guards at Myola, but the main Japanese defensive position was then at Eora Creek, a little bit further to the north, which I've indicated on this plan here. Our site at Eora Creek is actually one of the highest points on the Kokoda Track. The uh, track runs uh, from Kokoda, which is around about uh, 300 metres above sea level. The highest point of the track is about 2,100 metres above sea level, and our site is just near that. So it's quite a climb. As you can see from the lower map, the site is actually at the northern end of the Kokoda Track. So it was the last battle fought between the Japanese and the Australians on the track before the Australian forces were able to enter Kokoda in November 1942 as an uncontested occupation. The Japanese had withdrawn even further north. So here's our site in a contemporary 1942 aerial photograph. As you can see, it's rather isolated, jungle covered, 100% uh, rainforest cover and uh, deep ravines all around. So no major topographical features to identify it. It's uh, rather a nondescript place from the air. Here's another uh, reconnaissance shot looking towards the south from just above Kokoda, looking down the uh, valley of Viora Creek. And we can see the uh, site indicated on the right, Alola, which is a village that still remains, though the site has, has moved a couple of hundred metres. The village still remains and it's our base of operations for our work there. And just above that is Eora Creek, which uh, was a village at the time. It's no longer a village, it's just a camping ground now on the Kokoda Track. So that's the general area of our work. As the um, Japanese forces entered the uh, Eora Creek Valley in the centre there, their forces snaked down both sides of the valley. So on the western side, on the right of the photograph, they went down the Kokoda Track and they 
also sent forces down the eastern side of the valley, down towards Abuweri, where the 53rd Battalion also fought them and uh, had to withdraw after the attack. So both sides of the valley were utilised and tracks all over that valley utilised by the Japanese at the time. This uh, is, is a modern Google representation of our area of work, uh, looking north towards uh, Kokoda itself. Down the Eora Creek Valley, you can see Eora Creek campsite in the foreground there. So the Japanese uh, entered the valley from Kokoda, uh, as indicated by the red arrow. There's Alola Village, our base of operations for the work in the area. A little bit further along the valley, as I mentioned, is Eora Creek, now campsite, uh, previously a village. This will give you an idea of where the Japanese forces uh, were at the Second Battle of Eora Creek. So as the Australians are advancing from the south towards the north, they're coming along the Kokoda track and they have to cross Eora Creek. And the Japanese, indicated in the blue area, had set up a defensive position on the western side of the creek on high ground overlooking the crossings and overlooking the old village site. So their idea was to remain in place and contest that uh, crossing by the Australian forces. This is a, a view looking west across the Eora Creek Valley. You can see the Kokoda track running in the foreground there and they are some GPS tracks of uh, some of our survey work just to give you an idea of the sorts of topography that we're working in up there recording the sites and this is a general representation of uh, our study area. The yellow rectangle indicates uh, our study area for what we refer to as the lost battlefield of Atoa now. Uh, the red lines indicate the general area of the Japanese defensive positions and the green arrow shows you the advance of the Australian forces. Now this is what it actually looks like on the ground. We're now at the Eora Creek campsite, looking north down uh, the valley. Alola village is over the ridge on the left-hand side of the photograph. The Australians were advancing from behind the photographer's position towards the north and the battlefield is up the ridge to the left. The battlefield itself is not shown in this photograph, it's so high up that even uh, the uh, mosaic couldn't quite encompass it. But from a position on that ridge, as the Australians uh, came down into the valley to cross the Eora Creek, which lies about 100 metres below the campsite here, they were fired on by a Japanese mountain gun and that basically opened up the uh, second battle at Eora Creek. So while we were there, what did we actually find? Well, we found a range of features on the ground and artefacts too. The, certainly, by far, the greatest number of items we found were single-man fighting pits. There were probably over 200 of those. They're small excavations into the ground, probably a metre and a half deep and half a metre wide, to hold a single soldier. Then there are two-man fighting pits, which probably held things like machine guns and uh, heavy weapons such as that. Specialist machine gun pits, which I'll show you an example of later. The artillery positions. Now, the Japanese had three types of artillery in the area, and uh, we found at least two of their artillery positions. Command and control positions, where the battle was directed from, and scattered weapons and ammunition, some of which still lies open on the ground and we found at least two sets of human remains, but we believe that there are up to 80 Japanese soldiers still buried on the battlefield from the historic accounts. So here's an example of one of the single-man fighting pits which uh, we were able to identify. I should say at this point that our method of identifying these as fighting pits, you can see some of the leaf litter has been pulled back from the surface here to expose the top of the fighting pit. They appear simply as depressions in the ground as, as one conducts the survey. The method by which we determine that they're actually deeper features is actually to go over to them and jump up and down on them. And if they're springy and if they sink slightly, then we know that there's up to 700 mil, sometimes up to a metre of leaf litter in a deep hole rather than it simply being a depression on the ground. They're actually you get quite adept at this over time and a simple depression in the ground can be quite readily differentiated from a deeper pit which is just full of uh, leaf litter uh, such as uh, one of these. So that's a single man fighting pit. We've got one of the machine gun pits that I mentioned earlier on. The images on the right hand side are contemporary drawings done from one of the brigade war diaries of similar features found 
up at Irabawa and they've been put in the war diary for identification purposes so that the uh, soldiers know what to uh, expect in some of the Japanese positions further on. So we, here we have a uh, machine gun pit with a berm in the centre and then two firing areas to the right and to the left there with a, a berm uh, behind which the uh, gunners can actually take cover from returning fire. The blue tape is one of our methods of indicating that we've already recorded one of these uh, features so that we don't double record, we don't waste time recording features that another party, another survey team has already undertaken and we can go back and readily identify areas a couple of years later, sites that we've already identified on the study site so that we can quickly identify areas where we've been and go to areas where we uh, are yet to undertake recording. Here is uh, one of the artillery positions uh, that I mentioned earlier. This is actually the position that first fired on the Australians as they came down the ridge to the south. Uh, that's the photograph on the left. The photograph on the right is a cache of used artillery shells, both 70mm and 75mm artillery shells on the site. We know that they had a third type of gun, the 37mm anti-personnel, anti-tank gun, which they used on the site. So the, the Japanese had a number of these positions around uh, firing on the Australians who had no heavy weapons to speak of for much of the battle. The Australians had some three-inch mortars, but uh, because of uh, difficulties with premature explosions, uh, they were quickly put out of action. So the Australians had to uh, fight artillery, basically with hand weapons, with machine guns, hand grenades and rifles. Here are some of the other surface items that we've been able to identify. The top left shows a Japanese uh, two-inch mortar with some of its uh, ammunition lying next to it. Top right photograph shows some five round clips from the 6.5mm uh, Japanese Arasaka rifle. This uh, little cache was hidden in the, uh, in the roots of a tree behind one of the one-man fighting pits. The uh, image on the bottom left shows some Japanese two-inch uh, mortar shells in a local creek line. Now the story behind this site was that it's just off the Kokoda track, it's not actually on the battlefield site at all, but it was reported to us by the people at Alola as uh, a resupply and uh, an Australian plane had come and shot one of the Japanese resupply horses that were working their way along the track and the horse had been killed. The ammunition had rolled down off the track down slope and is now found in this creek line. More about horses a bit later in the talk. And the photograph on the bottom right shows some of the 75mm um, artillery shells that are still just lying on the battlefield or on parts of the battlefield. A two inch Australian mortar shell lying on top of them and in the background the toe of an Australian army issue boot. A lot of the material culture, weaponry and ammunition from the battlefield site now actually resides in Alola itself. So the battlefield site formed part of the traditional hunting grounds of several families from Alola. Over the years they were able to retrieve a lot of the weaponry and a lot of the ammunition from the battlefield and bring it down and turn it into a small museum for uh, trekkers in the village itself. So here we have a photograph from one of our first visits and part of our job in this uh, last program was to actually accession this material, so the blue tape indicates that we've dealt with it and some of the recording photographs on the right hand side there indicate that we are recording the weaponry individually, so we've got a Japanese uh, copy of a Vickers machine gun at the top there, a Japanese machine gun replacement barrel in the centre and the parts of a Japanese battalion radio that we were able to identify and partly record on one of our trips up there. So the material in the museum has now been accessioned into the database at the um, Papua New Guinea National Museum in Port Moresby, though the material remains in Alola itself. One of the things that we need to constantly remind ourselves about dealing with battlefields and with human remains is that we are dealing with real people, that their presence and their families back home need to be taken account of. For example, on the left-hand side, we have a photograph of a Japanese water bottle with the etched name Tanaka written on it. And uh, given the right historical sources and access to them in Tokyo, uh, the regimental uh, death lists, we can uh, track 
this man and identify his family eventually. Centre photograph shows a single man fighting pit with a Japanese helmet perched on top. We suspect that this contains the remains of a Japanese soldier buried there. And the right hand photograph shows an Australian army boot. Now this army boot uh, at the time that this photograph was taken had a human foot in it and it was uh, actually part of a burial that we were asked to have a look at and give our opinion on on our first trip up to the site. It's an Australian army boot, we were able to positively identify that, but uh, we were told that the uh, skeletal remains in there had been revealed, had been excavated prior to our arrival, and the inhabitant of the grave was wearing a Japanese helmet. The group fill of the grave also had Australian currency and uh, a watch with made in Japan in English on the face. So we said on the basis of that, that uh, balance of probabilities it was an Australian, though DNA testing was really the only way to establish that one way or the other. Uh, on the basis of that, uh, our client released a press release uh, identifying it as a potential Australian soldier and the Unrecovered War Casualties Unit of the Australian Army then exhumed the body and identified it actually as a private from the 144th Regiment, a private Joshi Kato. His remains were identified through DNA analysis and uh, they were returned to the Consul General in Port Moresby and we believe that they may now be back in Japan with his family. Here's a plan of the uh, features that uh, we were able to identify on the battlefield itself, over 370, which included one two-man machine gun pits, all the features that I've described before, individual items of uh, ordnance, uh, ammunition and helmets, all across that ridge line. The uh, line on the right-hand side is the line of the Kokoda track, the uh, rather squiggly green line moving from right to left in the centre of the image shows our GPS track up the slope as we were identifying features and then the area of the lost battlefield is shown as a concentration of features in the uh, left-hand side of the image. So one of the ways of analysing the, a lot of these features is to look at the orientation. So we were able to identify which direction a lot of these fighting pits would have been looking towards or firing at and it uh, was all very consistent with the idea that the Australians were advancing upslope from the east or from the right of the image. But we can probably get a little bit more detail, look at some of these features. Here we've got a close-up of some single man fighting pits and also some machine gun pits. We can see at the top right there some contour lines marked in green. And on the ground it's much easier to see, but we can explain these as uh, the Japanese forces creating what we'd refer to as dead ground in these hollows, in these little re-entrants coming up slope, so that they're able to fire down onto the Australians trying to sneak up through these gullies. At the left-hand side of the image, that blue line running diagonally is the feature that we refer to as Jap Road, uh, and uh, I'll talk about that in some more detail in a moment, but along Jap Road are some larger bunkers, some open area features that don't appear to be oriented towards the advancing Australians, and uh, at the moment we're interpreting those as command and control features, uh, possibly for the battalion and regimental commanders, some of the officers and containing radio equipment, etc. Some more detailed look at some of the uh, features here. We've been able to tease out some particular defensive lines and lines of fire down particular contours from some of these features. In the centre of the image we can see some different types of features. The horizontal bars indicate two-man trenches rather than single-man fighting pits or machine gun pits. And we suspect that these may have been dug by the Australians as they advanced across the contour line here and then dug in for the night. So the Second Battle of Eora Creek took over a week and uh, at some of uh, the periods the Australians had to uh, entrench themselves in the Japanese or near the Japanese defensive lines. So we're looking at some of those features as Australian dug defensive features. I mentioned Jap Road a little earlier on. This uh, feature was identified both in the Australian official history as a line on a map just referred to as Jap Road but also is referred to by the locals as a feature dating from the war period. And we were able to look at this feature and survey it. It runs from Alola village 
parallels the Kokoda Track but runs on the ridge above it. We followed it all the way towards the Lost Battlefield and identified pits and features along its course and it gets to a point just above the Lost Battlefield and it stops, literally in a wall of earth. So it's a very interesting feature. One of the aspects that we, we are looking at is uh, the Japanese developing a parallel supply route to the Kokoda Track. So the Kokoda Track was well known, was identified, but uh, we feel that the Japanese may have wanted to supplement that as a supply route and may have done some improvement of existing native tracks. And we're looking at employing horses to the south of Kokoda and using this route perhaps as a way of introducing horse transport to the south to carry supplies. This uh, video was to be showing a, uh, a part of our survey up the track and uh, showing some embankments on either side. It's a difficult feature to identify photographically, but once you're on the ground, you uh, can readily see that you're walking between two large embankments. It's not a creek line because it's on top of a ridge. There are certainly uh, evidence of Japanese uh, features along the whole of this route and we suspect that it runs further north from Alola all the way down to Kokoda and that will be part of some subsequent survey work that we're planning later this year, perhaps early next year in 2016. The idea that Japanese may have been using horses along the track or on areas of the track is not certain. There are small pieces of information that are certainly suggesting that they attempted to use horses on the track. It's an aspect of the history of the battle that uh, really hasn't been dealt in any great detail before. The image on the left is a captured Japanese profile of the Kokoda track and the portion of it here shows the section between Kokoda and Eora Creek and the annotations in Japanese indicate uh, several areas where it would be difficult for horses, where bridges would have to be installed if horses are to be used here. So it's certainly an indication that the Japanese at some stage were planning on the use of horses along the track or on supplying parts of their forces along the track using horses. This map by itself does not prove that horses were being used, just that they were planning on doing it. Some of the material culture associated with pack horses we've actually been able to identify just outside Alola itself. So on the bottom right hand side we have the iron frame from a Japanese pack saddle which was found uh, or shown to us recently by the owner of the garden who had found it while doing gardening just below the village. So the top right photograph shows the metal frame with the leather and padding and the strapping for uh, use on a horse. At this stage all we found is the pack saddle frame itself and so we suspect that uh, horses at least had been used as far as a Lola village with the intention that they would be used along the entirety of the track. One of the other very interesting finds that I mentioned a bit earlier was the find of a Japanese battalion radio in one of the single man fighting pits. Whilst we've not undertaken any controlled archaeological excavation, the locals who live and work on the land are uh, entitled to dig on their own land and we were presented with the corroded block that you see in the bottom centre photograph there on the end of a shovel saying look what we found what do you think it is. We had to do a bit of careful excavation of the corroded block you can see up on the top left photograph and some of the features that came out with the, uh, the metal block are shown at the bottom right which show earpieces, plugs, dials etc not suffering from corrosion and uh, an image of the battalion transmitter up above. So. This would seem to have been dumped in one of the single man fighting pits during the retreat of the Japanese forces once the position had been lost and so we would expect that nearby we would find the uh, corresponding receiver piece in another pit perhaps that will be work for the future. It's been uh, referred to for some years as the lost battlefield and this is rather a contentious term. People will say yes well how can it be a lost battlefield when we know the site of the battle has been there for 70 years. Well that's quite true. One thing we have been able to do with our survey work is identify that the scale of the battle is understood through the official history which is the you can see the map on the left there is actually much larger and part of the battlefield hasn't been identified before 
and that's the area which we have recently surveyed. So just to give you some idea, the official history plan on the left and one of our survey plans on the right, they've been uh, scaled to the same scale. So you can see on the top of the official history plan is the area which was referred to as the uh, egg-shaped defensive location with the Australian attack from the uh, left-hand side which turned the position and uh, captured the site at Eora Creek. If we identify that on the same scale on each of the plans, you can see that the area that we are now working in is an area that wasn't identified as part of the original battlefield. So we've been able to show that the scale of the battle was much larger and we've been able to extend some of our understanding of where the battle was actually fought. One of the most important and most intriguing aspects of our work up there has been our work with the local community. I mentioned earlier on that we had included the local community in our work. They, of course, are our hosts. We are on their land. We live in their village while we're doing the work. They're very happy to show us some of their hunting techniques. Uh, on top right, we can see uh, possums recently be caught uh, for dinner by some of these young lads. The gentleman in the centre, one of our chief organisers and uh, chief uh, interlocutors, David Soru, owns part of the land on which the Lost Battlefield is found and we've undertaken extensive oral history recording with David and members of his family and extended members of the village as well. They show us around their land, they're very happy to show us and they show us all of the features that they can take us along Jap Road, show us where they know that uh, ammunition is, where they might know where a helmet is. And so they're very much our guides. But we've also been able to more seriously look at the oral history tradition of the battle itself. Part of our work has been to record this oral history and you can see the cover there of our final report on the oral history. We've looked at aspects of the battle and aspects of village life before the battle, some of their traditional life, and uh, how the villages were actually affected by the Australian forces coming through. So the oral history has provided us with origin stories for the local inhabitants. We've been able to identify mythological places on the battlefield itself and around the greater landscape. And that's why we now refer to the site as the Lost Battlefield of Etoa, because that's the local name for the site. Etoa was explained to us as uh, part of a local spring which trickles down from the top of the ridge down towards Eora Creek and was actually enveloped by the Japanese defensive position to deprive the Australians of drinking water. And it was that spring which was part of the reason that the Japanese sighted their defensive position here. We've been able to also record in the oral history some wartime anecdotes that have been passed down. We've now at a position where there are only two people still alive in the village who were alive at the time of the battle. Those two people, uh, two of the elderly ladies in the village, they were only four and five and so only have very vague memories but were told by their parents in the subsequent years about stories of what had gone on in the area during the, the wartime and so we've been able to record those and of course the oral history tradition of the village itself has passed many wartime stories down to other members of the community. The oral history has also been able to identify many local place names. So the local mountain, Ilubu, Fabula, one of the local creeks, and uh, Lala Creek, another of the local creeks that are not contained in the Australian official history. So this is looking at the conflict from the perspective of one of the participants whose views have not been considered in detail to date. So we hope that our work there will be able to redress some of that balance. And we've also been able to look at the consequences of what the conflict meant to the community at the time and subsequently. So, for example, one of the stories, we've been able to track what happened to the community as a whole as the Japanese came through from the north. So the Japanese, as I mentioned earlier, coming south from Kokoda, the villagers at Alola are warned by one of the local Kiaps, one of the local government men, that the Japanese are coming and that they are all to go to the hills, basically run away. Go bush, they were told. Not knowing exactly what to do or, or what was uh, happening, as the Japanese approached the village at Alola, they crossed Eora Creek and went up 
to the top of the Mount Nalubu, and the people from Abuweri did the same. As the Japanese came down the eastern side of the valley, both communities met at the top of Alubu. And they stayed there until they felt that it was safe to try and make their way down across Eora Creek Valley. And they had to wait, as the Japanese forces moved down the track, they had to wait for gaps in the Japanese forces so that they could quickly run across the creek and make their way to what they thought was safety at the time. We've got stories of some groups of uh, locals being caught as they were trying to cross the creek and uh, the deadly consequences uh, of being caught. One story relates that one woman who was caught drinking at the creek as she crossed was shot by the Japanese and was decapitated and her head was placed on a stick to warn or scare other locals as they tried to cross the creek there. So the local community made its way from Ilubu managed to cross the creek largely unhindered and make its way up towards Etoa. Some of them camped on the western side of Etoa itself. Others went uh, further south and uh, stayed with family. We are told that many of those that stayed on Etoa lived there and some of the braver ones would uh, creep back towards their village and observe the Japanese there, maybe try and steal some supplies but they mostly lived in the bush until the Japanese forces started to reinforce the site at Atoa in October 1942, uh, whereupon the community had to move further towards the west. But some brave souls again managed to stay and uh, claim that they were able to observe the battle itself. So one of the outcomes of this oral history is we're able to present back to the community some of its own knowledge. So here are some information sheets that we prepared to be presented at the local primary school as part of their curriculum on traditional life before the war, indicating some of the uh, practices that the old ladies shown in the photographs undertook, uh, some of the material culture that they used and also some of the work that we are doing up there, identifying some of the military material culture on the site undertaking archaeological survey and explaining our presence there. We've also been able to put together some information on the village during the war, interweave some of the local oral history with some of the official history to put their local stories in a slightly wider context and see how their small community fitted into what was in effect a world conflict at the time. And we've also presented some of this information in uh, Pigeon so that it can be presented to the local primary school as well as uh, part of their history curriculum. That's Alola and Eora Creek. The second site is another site that we're looking at just outside Port Moresby. It's about 22 k's east of Port Moresby on the southern slope of a feature called Hombrum Bluff. And this was supposedly the site of General Blamey's headquarters during the fight at Kokoda. So if it was, it's an important historical site. The Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Armed Forces, or New Guinea Forces it was referred to then, his headquarters during the Kokoda campaign would be an important site to identify. So we were asked to have a look at this area. Here's a contemporary wartime map showing the valley of the Laloki River. The site itself is just above the area indicated as native huts there. It's on a very steep south-facing slope on a major outcrop of rock called Hombrum Bluff. It's a very nice part of the countryside outside Port Moresby, but quite a, a different type of landscape to the rainforest that we'd been looking at at Eora Creek. Here are some, on the left, a contemporary aerial photograph of it. You'll notice a large lagoon in the area just below the cliff there, near the propeller blade of the plane. The site that we're looking at is centred around that. It's basically a hanging swamp developed from a spring that is coming out of the rock there and it changes the local landscape from a savanna landscape into a sort of a micro rainforest which surrounds the, uh, surrounds the lagoon so you can see the change in vegetation between the light and the dark there. This area during the war was a major supply and administration area so we can see a couple of sites near Hombrum Bluff at the time. One of those is the 2nd 9th Australian General Hospital, the general hospital for Australian military forces during the major part of the Kokoda campaign and at one stage had over 
2,000 people who were, were wounded and in need of assistance there, so rather a large concern, but there was also a major engineering works uh, nearby and a cordial factory for making cordial for the troops. So it was very much a, a large amount of admin and support troops in the area of which we were looking at. Here's an image showing the headquarters of uh, New Guinea Force in October, November 1942. So this was the sort of site that we were trying to identify up at Blamey's garden, and there's Blamey and his immediate staff on the bottom right there. Blamey, of course, was the commander of the Australian military forces in the Second World War. Up until September 1942, he had been... Uh, working with the Australian forces in Australia. His base was in Melbourne. But in September 1942, as the Australians were being pushed back along the Kokoda Track, pressure from the American government, from Douglas MacArthur, who you can see in the top right image there, and the Australian government forced Blamey to go up to Papua New Guinea and take the battle in his own hands, as it was said at the time to ensure that the withdrawal stopped and that the Japanese would be beaten. So Blamey flew up, and this is a photograph of him meeting MacArthur outside the Papua Hotel in Port Moresby. This is his uh, arrival. And so Blamey had to establish his headquarters for the subsequent battles somewhere around Port Moresby. So that was what we were looking at. So here's the site on the ground. This is uh, our first visit there, and so the type of countryside we're looking at is relatively steep slope savanna country with a small area of rainforest in the circle there. In the area immediately behind the foreground is the small valley of the Loki River which you've got to cross by foot. Both bridges uh, which once uh, crossed the river there are, uh, have both been washed away in subsequent floods. You've got to pick your time to cross the river. You normally cross early in the morning when it's relatively low and it's around about thigh high. After about three o'clock, the uh, hydroelectric dam a little bit further up the river tends to let out more water so that it can make more electricity as people go home and turn their air conditioners on. And the water level can rise up to your armpit. So uh, by that stage, you usually uh, can't cross and you've got to spend the night on the other side of the river. This is the lagoon, which I mentioned before. So it's surrounded by sago palms. It's a very uh, idyllic spot. It's got a lot of uh, local legends associated with it. There's legends of warriors rising out of the centre here, for example, on rocks to ward off intruders. There's also a legend about a mythical crocodile living in the lagoon as well. So it's a place of great power for the locals, as well as being uh, a beautiful spot. So our work there consisted of a survey up the road, which uh, was at the time referred to as a jeep track. And uh, we're identifying the road alignment itself and features along that road. So here's us walking down to the Laloki River on the top left. Some features that we've identified, machine parts. There's a, an old culvert for the roadway made out of 44-gallon drums in the bottom left. Parts of a jeep on the bottom right. And uh, we can see that the Australian Survey Corps has been active in the area because there's a survey marker on the top right from a survey of the site undertaken in November 1943. So when we get up to the top, this is the site that uh, greets us. It's, as I said, it's savannah country and there's, in the area that we're working, it's 100% cover. Grass cover, kunai grass, very difficult to see through. It's usually about at least waist high, if not up to the armpits, so very difficult to identify features. We were able to convince the local landowner, Gideon, that we needed the area cleared and he said he would burn off or cook the grass, as they call it. And he did that over a series of months, which then revealed features such as this. So once the grass is burnt off, we can see stone-lined pathways. This is uh, one of the major pathways leading up to a lookout on the uh, eastern side of the site. And this is an area that we call a roundabout. This is a turning circle for vehicles near some building platforms that we're also able to identify and record. Here's uh, one of the building platforms on the right, so built up dry stone wall from local stone and then fill on top, and then remains of uh, asbestos on top of that building platform with some steps leading down to the roadway, which you can see on the left-hand side of the image. Some other features, again, 
lots of evidence of uh, motor vehicle maintenance. So we've got some uh, Jeep parts again, some brake pads, axles on the left-hand side, and some concrete sluices, perhaps some areas which were used as washdown points for the vehicles on the right-hand side there. Within the garden itself, scattered items. That's a ship's boiler, which has been brought up to site for some reason. Uh, some people suspect it's a water container, maybe uh, f for use in, as showers. On the right-hand side of the image there is a ladder, which had been used to gain access to one of the site's lookouts. On the bottom left image is uh, large amounts of signal wire through the jungle there, so communications were obviously important for the site, and a jeep seat. So very ephemeral remains, nothing particularly substantial, not much indicating that the site may have been Blamey's Garden, and, and we weren't able to actually make any of the photographic images correspond to the building platforms that we're able to identify. So here's a, an image of our survey showing most of the features. You can see that the focus, again, is on the lagoon. Both the vehicle tracks circle that, and then there are pathways running between the vehicle tracks and the lagoon and between the vehicle tracks and each other. Some individual items, small bridges, an area referred to as a swimming pool, didn't quite gel as uh, something to do with Blamey's headquarters. So some more images of some of the features a little bit lower down towards the vehicular track. Still, yet nothing substantial indicating a headquarters. So what was the site? Some bit of historical research identified the site not actually as Blamey's headquarters, which uh, I think we've recently identified as being in another part of Port Moresby, but an establishment that was a brainchild of Blamey's and was referred to as Blamey's Garden, but it was established in November 1943 as a flora and fauna park by Blamey. On the left-hand side is a, a letter, copy of a letter from Blamey establishing the garden and three purposes. One of the uh, most critical was to have a refuge for the flora and fauna of New Guinea so that the soldiers could take rest and reflection within the grounds and it would also act as a, a biobank in a sense for some of the fauna and flora that uh, Blamey felt might be in danger from the war. It was set up in November 1943 and was run by Port Moresby Subbase Area Command as an army installation. So at one stage they had three NCOs and six other ranks and about 100 native in paid employment to maintain the garden. And it was under the command of a gentleman by the name of Harold Root. He was originally a warrant officer but uh, was commissioned, was given uh, a lieutenancy and uh, that's Root's handwriting on the right-hand side in a letter personally to Blamey, thanking him for the establishment of the garden and uh, giving some details about the establishment. A recent historical research suggests that Mr Root was in fact Blamey's personal gardener back in Victoria. That's only an anecdote from uh, a letter in another war memorial file at the moment, so I need to track that down in a little more detail, but it would appear that Blamey's association with Root was based on his personal employment in his garden in Victoria. So we are undertaking some of the same sorts of things associated with Blamey's garden as I explained earlier on with the Alola community. Here's Gideon in uh, his element. He's a very enthusiastic landowner. He owns the land on which Blamey's garden now sits and he collects items from the garden and uh, is starting his own museum. Here is he on the left-hand side explaining some of the items that he has. Part of a recent oral history seminar at the uh, National Museum visited Gideon and we were able to record some of his stories associated with the war. He's an avid collector of his own family history. So on the bottom left here we've got Gideon counting off some of the years between the early part of the 20th century and now, and indicating what his father was doing at particular times when he was born, when he went to school, and he's developing a real family background through newspaper cuttings as well, as you can see in the centre there. So he scours newspapers and he's developing the site himself with his family, which you can see on the bottom right here. 
I've recently been informed that the regional governor is so impressed with Gideon's efforts and his uh, management plan or the proposed management plan that they are prepared to allocate 100,000 kina to the development of Gideon's Blamey's Garden as a tourism site. It won't be a tourism site for Blamey's headquarters, however, it will be a tourism site for the Flora and Fauna Park and it will probably also become an orchid refuge. Gideon is very interested in orchids too. So looking towards a great future for Gideon and developing management plans now for both Eora Creek and Blamey's Garden so that they can be managed in a profitable way for the local landowners but maintaining their heritage significance. Thanks very much.